and welcome back to Kester's Forest. Now you may recall about a year ago, possibly even more, during one of my Japan unboxing videos, I pulled out a Famicom and a disc system. Now when I bought that, I kind of knew that it probably wouldn't work, and the idea really was to try and get it for a cheap price, fix it up, and get to the point where I could actually finally play some Japanese Famicom disc games. Well, in the end, I'm glad to say I can now finally play disc games, but the journey and how I got there didn't quite pan out the way I intended. Let's take a look and see what happened. The Famicom was released in Japan by Nintendo in 1983, and then in 1986, they released the disc system, which plugs in underneath. And aside from having more capacity for games, it allows you to save them too. Just gonna switch it on there, and nothing. So, before we go around messing about, has it got power? Nothing's happening. Okay. Nothing's happening, nothing's happening. All right. I think we're gonna need to clean this. So first, remove these four screws. After removing the base, you can see the pins here, and these are the ones that need cleaning. I recommend using some IPA or, or some electric contact cleaner, and if it really doesn't shift it, you can use Brasso, but be very careful with the pins. There we go! Alright, we have liftoff. Nothing. Okay. Right. So, I'm gonna say pretty confidently this has a probably got a belt issue. Now it's well known that the Famicom Disk System disk drive belts deteriorate very easily and unfortunately uh, need replacing and it's not an easy job. So this is what I'm about to attempt to do um, just by you know first taking the lid off the batteries out and getting access to the drive and as you can see here yep there it is that's a piece of the belt that is just you know crumbled over you know over time due to its age we're gonna have to open this up now and get the rest of it out and give it a good clean before replacing it with a new one now having taken the screws out of the disk drive mount itself i actually need to take the controller board off as well because I need to get access to this uh, cable at the back here and uh, just pull that and get it out a bit stiff there we go and a bit more of the belt found underneath here I'm sure we'll find even more when we get inside remove these three screws And here we go. Can you see that there? I'll just uh, point out to you. There's, there's a bit more belt there. It's stuck to this spindle here. And we're going to have to take this off. It's pretty glued on there. A little bit more on the other end. Yep. So let's, uh, let's do the tricky bit now and get this taken apart. this bit's a bit fiddly you need to twist it around sort of about a quarter of the way around clockwise pull it up and then down and away you need a bit of a wiggle there gently cleaning off the rest of the belt with some IPA to soften it up um, I'm actually using my fingernails because they're quite it's quite soft and won't damage anything and then giving it uh, a bit of an extra clean with some, there's actually some baby wipes and a bit more IPA just to finish up. Mm -hmm. 
And here's the replacement belt, which I ordered off eBay. Uh, a guy called Nick Disc makes these, and I'll put the link in the description below. Now, getting the belt back on and lined up before you put it back together around all the cogs and etc is actually quite tricky to do and there are a few different methods for this uh, but the one I'm using uh, seemed to work for me and I have put a link below to the tutorial that showed me how to do this. Now then getting this bracket back on is essentially the reverse of before so you're sort of sliding it up and into the cog giving it a wiggle until you feel it and sort of turning it anti-clockwise as you go uh, until you feel it click in. Now then, if you've done this right and you've positioned the belt well, uh, you should be able to do each end one at a time and just pull it back over the cogs there and the spindle and just make sure it's all lined up properly and moving as it should. Now then, once you've got everything all back together again, this last part is essential and you know, you'll get more information on this in greater detail in the link below, but you need to realign the spindle hub so by uh, turning the cog to the right position and then adjusting this with a small allen key at the front, you should get what you need. If you're interested in which capacitors you actually need to repair this, I have listed them below for both the adapter and the disc system itself. Let's see what happens when I put a disc in. Okay. Well, sometimes, no matter how hard you try, some things just don't pan out the way you want them to. And no matter what I did, cleaning, changing capacitors, changing the belt, I just could not get this thing to work. So what am I going to do? I've got a big stack of Famicom games to play now and nothing to play them on. So in the end, after much umming and ahhing, I went back on Sendico and I bought myself one of these. Now this is a sharp twin Famicom and this plays both cartridge games and disc games. So let's take a closer look at exactly how that works. The Famicom Twin was released in Japan only in 1986, with a revised version releasing the following year in 87. This is the revised version you're looking at here. As you can see, it plays both cartridges and discs, and you can switch between the two using this switch at the top here, and eject the cartridges using this button at the bottom. This revised version of the Twin Famicom has Rapid Fire built into the controllers. And as with both versions of the Twin, it has AV Out which makes it a lot easier to play in other countries. So first let's just check the cartridge slot is working with a, a short session on Batman which was one of the best games on the Famicom or the NES. Yeah, that's pretty good. Switching over now, uh, we remove the cardboard protector and put in a copy of Falcian and see how we get on. Oh, that's a bit more promising. Stuff's happening. Hmm. Now, this has a new belt already, so I know it's supposed to work, but it, it doesn't appear to. So I took it apart a little bit and thought maybe it just needed a bit of a tune. Very frustrating. Error 27. This is the one you usually get when there is a problem with the calibration of the drive. 
Now, it could be the drive, or it could just be that the games themselves are a bit dirty, so the first thing for me to really do is just try a bunch of games and see, well, just see what happens. Ah! Something's happening! Something loaded, okay. So this is Doki Doki Panic, and as with uh, most games on the Famicom, you actually have to flip the disc over uh, once the first load screen appears. So here we go. Oh. In fact, the problem got even worse. After rejecting the disc loading side one, nothing would happen. And I traced the fault to this switch on the side, which is supposed to release when you eject the disc. Looking at the switch here with the tweezers, you can see this top line was actually buckled, this piece of metal, and when I straightened it, that fixed the problem and the discs were again registering once ejected. So that might be something to check for if you're experiencing a similar issue. But after calibrating the spindle multiple times, it still didn't work. So I turned my attention to two other options. The first is this screw right here. Now there's very little online about this screw, and really it's just a case of trial and error by turning it very very slightly to the left and right and seeing if you can finally get it to read. And there is one last thing you can try, which is to try tuning the speed of the motor itself to see if that, in combination with the screw, gets the disc to finally read. So there we have it. I can finally play my Famicom disc games, but not quite in the way I originally intended. Going back over a year ago to when I bought that, you know, broken disc system from Sendico, right through to now where I have my lovely, fully functioning twin Famicom, I learned a lot. I've put links in the description below to all the people that helped me figure my way through this. Um, what I do hope that this might have done is, you know, pull together all the different things that could possibly go wrong because I feel like everything that could have gone wrong did go wrong this time. Um, you know, and things don't pan out the way they, you intend them to sometimes, but I got where I wanted to be and I learned a lot along the way. Well, that's it for this week. I hope you learned something and I hope you enjoyed yourself and I will see you next time on Kester's Forest.